Okay, uh, so in the first part of this section, we looked at functions that we wanted to integrate where the integrand was specifically a power of sine times a power of cosine. Here we're looking at something similar, but now it's a power of tangent times a power of secant. So we have a specific strategy for these, um, and uh, the Pythagorean identity that we were using in the previous video has a couple of different forms, one of which is, is helpful here as well. Namely, uh, this identity right here, secant squared of x is equal to one plus tangent squared of x. That identity is, is really what's motivating this strategy that we're using here. So uh, this kind of follows a similar pattern. We look at the parity of the powers, parity meaning odd or even, um, of these different trig functions. So what our part A of our strategy here, if the power of your secant function is an even number, then we save one factor of secant squared, not just secant this time, but secant squared, and then use this secant squared of x equals one plus tangent squared of x to express the remaining factors in terms of tangent. This kind of shows you what that looks like. I'm not going to talk through this because we'll see it in the examples that we do. Here, if the power of your tangent function is an odd number, then save one factor of secant times tangent, and then use this version of the Pythagorean identity, tangent squared equals secant squared minus one, to express the remaining factors in terms of secant. Um, the, the purpose of saving these factors here, the secant squared in this case, in the secant tangent in this case is because those will be the du that you need when you make a u substitution. Okay, a couple of integrals that will be important to remember. You would have already talked about these in calculus one, so we're not deriving them here, we're just reminding you. Uh, the integral of tangent is the natural log of the absolute value of secant, secant of x, plus c of course. The integral of secant of x dx is equal to the natural log of the absolute value of secant plus tangent plus c. Okay, so we may need to use these in the process of doing these examples. Let's start with this one here. We want to evaluate the integral of tangent squared of x times secant to the fourth of x. Now our strategy that we just talked through only had two cases. One is if the secant function has an odd, an even power, and the other is if the tangent function has an odd power. Our tangent does not have an odd power, but our secant does have an even power. So we're going to use the first of those two cases that we came across just above. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this as the integral of tangent squared times secant squared of x times secant squared of x dx. I'm saving one of these secant squareds off to the side here, which I'm then going to use as a du in a, in a later step, okay? But now what we want to do is we want to express everything else over here in terms of tangents, because that's going to allow me to let u equal tangent of x, so that this secant squared dx is automatically coming out as my du. Um, the way that we're going to do that, we're going to leave this tangent squared of x alone, and then secant squared, remember we have that identity that says that secant squared of x is the same as one plus tangent squared of x. Leave this secant squared, should be an x. Whoop. Rewrite that, I'm not sure what I just did there. Secant squared of x dx, okay? Let's set u equal to tangent of x so that du is equal to secant squared of x dx, which again, we set this up so that du would automatically be there when we needed it, okay? Next up, because uh, I've now decided what u is, I'm gonna put everything in terms of u, so I have u squared times one plus u squared times du. And from here, it's super straightforward. Distribute the u squared in, I have u squared plus u to the fourth du, which becomes one third u cubed plus one fifth u to the fifth plus c. Now change your u's back into tangents again and call it a day. One third tangent cubed of x plus one fifth tangent to the fifth of x plus c. And we're done. Okay, so that one wasn't so bad. I mean, the, the last example that we did on the previous video was pretty lengthy. This one did not take a ton of work. 
but hopefully that gives you a sense of how this strategy works. Okay, um, where is, okay, Let's set this aside. We're not doing this one yet, we're gonna do this one. The next one we want to evaluate is the uh, integral of secant cubed of x. Now this one doesn't seem to fit either of those strategies that were mentioned, or either of the two cases in the strategy that we talked about at the beginning of this video. I don't see any tangents at all, but I do see a secant. However, that strategy uh, said what to do if the power on your secant function is even, and this time it's odd. So how do we approach this? Well, uh, before we approach it, I do wanna mention something. This integral, this specific integral of secant cubed actually shows up in some cool places. And that's the reason I want to cover this one. Uh, one of the places that the secant cubed function actually shows up is in the derivation for the hyperbolic trigonometric functions, cosh, cinch, tanch, those things. I'm debating whether or not to do a video on deriving uh, where exactly we get the formulas or the functions that we set cinch and cosh and all that stuff equal to. Because it's a really interesting in my opinion, it's a really interesting uh, application of some of the work we, we've done here. So if you see a video pop up about that, I'm, I'm, that's kind of what I'm debating if I have time to make one. Anyways, I'm stalling, so let's get into this. Secant cubed of x, how are we supposed to integrate this? Well, what I'm going to do is rewrite it as secant of x times secant squared of x dx, okay? Now this feels like what we would be doing in the first case of the strategy we just talked about, saving a secant squared factor. But the whole point of doing that would be to set uh, everything else in terms of tangent so that I can have a u substitution where u is equal to tangent and then I have this du here. I don't have any tangents over here to do that with and there's not a convenient formula for what we're able to do right now that converts just a secant of x into something involving a tangent. So what I'm going to do instead is apply what we learned in the previous section. I'm going to use integration by parts. And remember, integration by parts says I need to pick a u and a dv. And there's kind of a clear choice of which one dv should be. Secant squared. I'm going to set secant squared of x equal to my dv. Why? Because I recognize secant squared as the derivative of the tangent function. So that means the tangent is automatically going to be my v here. This secant, the remaining secant of x right there would have to be my u then. What is du? Um, i leave a ton of space here, but the natural log of secant of x plus tangent of x. That was really cramped. Sorry about that. Um, integration by parts says that this is equal to uv, so secant of x times tangent of x, minus the integral of v du. Um, oops, I'm sorry. I made a mistake here. You know what I did? I took an antiderivative of secant, not a derivative. Whoops. Let's fix that. Secant of x, tangent of x, dx. Yeah, you probably looked at that and thought, what is that guy doing? He doesn't. He should know better than that. Of course, of course. The derivative of secant is secant tangent. What am I doing? Um, all right, we've caught our mistake so we can keep moving. V du, I have a tangent here and a tangent here. Those are going to multiply, so I get secant of x times tangent squared of x dx. Okay, I feel a little better about that now. Next step, what should we do now? Well, um, it, it's still not immediately obvious how to approach this because it, this function, even though it involves a secant and a tangent, tangent doesn't fit either of those cases that we talked about previously still. So what I'm going to do is take my tangent squared here and rewrite it using my Pythagorean identity. So that's going to give me... Uh, tangent squared is the same thing as secant squared of x minus 1. This secant of x... I should have written first, but I didn't, so I'm just going to put it there. If I distribute that secant, what am I going to have? 
I'm going to have a secant cubed here, and I'm going to have a minus secant here. So let me, uh, let me do that and split this into two separate integrals. That's going to be minus the integral of secant cubed of x dx, and then this minus, once this minus distributes, is going to turn into a plus. So I'm going to have plus the integral of secant of x dx, okay? Now on the previous page, we, we did say that we know what this integral is from calculus 1. We're just going to go ahead and use that. So I have here secant of x tangent of x minus the integral of secant cubed of x dx, which I'm leaving alone just for a moment, plus the natural log of secant of x plus tangent of x and a big absolute value sign. Okay, and uh, there is going to be a plus C that's going to appear out here. But if you notice what's happened, I have secant cubed of X, which is where we started, and we've chipped away at it until we've gotten down here. So this is what secant cubed of X DX, when I integrate it, is going to come out to. And notice, kind of like one of the examples we saw in 7.1, that exact same integral appears again on the other side of this equation. Our approach back then was to take that and think of these two things as like terms and just add this to both sides, which gives me 2 times the integral of secant cubed dx equals secant of x tangent of x uh, plus the natural log of the absolute value of secant plus tangent plus c, and then I'm going to multiply both sides by one half. Which gives me this. Okay, this is going to be my final answer right there. I want to call attention to something that I just did. You may have caught this yourself. When I multiplied both sides of this equation by one half, you probably were expecting this to look like c over two, or one half times c, but I didn't do that. I just wrote it as c. Um, the reason why it's technically okay to do that is because this constant of integration is an arbitrary constant. That means it just represents some general unknown constant and if I were to take that and multiply it by one half, I still have some arbitrary constant. So putting a one half there isn't very informative because we just know that it's some unknown arbitrary constant in the first place. This is something that happens a whole lot in a differential equations class, which you can take after this one. Um, it's called an abuse of notation um, or kind of a, it's just a convenience to us because we don't want to complicate what this constant looks like if it's not necessary to do that, okay? So I just wanted to mention that in case you're looking at that and thinking, hey, that one half should have been there. It's okay that it's not. All right, so that's that one in the bag. Sorry about this weird mistake that I made up here. I went in the wrong direction somehow. Let's take a look at another one. This time we're looking at another definite integral. Uh, the definite integral goes from pi over four to pi over two. And our integrand is cosine to the fourth times cotangent to the fourth. Um, how do we deal with this? So this doesn't seem to fit either of the uh, either of the cases that we looked at in this section because so far we've only looked at integrals dealing with sines and cosines or tangents and secants, not cosecants and cotangents. But really, this is very very similar in how we handle it to if we had a secant and a tangent, because we have a similar identity that motivates our strategy. And it's this one, uh, cosecant squared of x is equal to one plus cotangent squared of x. These two functions are related by this identity. And so we can do kind of a similar strategy as we did with secant and tangent when dealing with this. Let's think about how this would look. I'm going to set up my integral here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to save for myself a factor of cosecant squared. So I'm going to have cosecant squared of x times cotangent to the fourth of x times cosecant squared of x dx. Okay, 
that cosecant squared is kind of filling the same role as the secant squared that we would have saved if this was a secant tangent type of interval integral. It's going to be used as a part of my du after I make a u substitution. But before I do that, I need to use my Pythagorean identity. So here's how that's going to look. I have this integral from pi over 4 to pi over 2. That cosecant squared is going to be my part of my du, which would only make sense if my u is cotangent. So I have a cotangent here. I don't have one here, but I have an identity that allows me to deal with that. My cosecant squared becomes 1 plus cotangent squared of x. Then I have this cotangent to the fourth of x. And then my cosecant squared of x dx. Now I'm going to set u equal to cotangent so that du is negative. Remember, this one gives me a negative. Cosecant squared of x dx, okay? The negative here doesn't appear in my integrand, so I account for that by multiplying both sides of this by negative 1, which means this cosecant squared dx can be substituted for a negative du. So I'm going to put that here. The negative is going to appear right there, okay? My integrand is going to look like 1 plus u squared times the co, uh, sorry, I almost wrote cotangent again. That's, that's a u now, u to the fourth du. And then I have limits of integration here as well. Remember, to deal with the limits of integration, you have to plug them in to your function because these are x values, but now we want them to be u values, the corresponding u values. So uh, plugging pi over 4 in, cotangent of pi over 4 is 1. Cotangent of pi over 2 is 0. Okay, now you might look at this and think that's that's odd because I have a, a larger number in my lower limit than I do in my upper limit. It feels backwards, and that's technically okay. We can actually resolve that using this negative right here. From calculus one, we know that if you have a negative, uh, like sitting outside of your integral right here, it can be used to flip the order of these limits of integration. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to use this negative to switch these around and make it go from 0 to 1. And at the same time, I'm also going to evaluate this integral. Um, in fact, actually, no, let me back it up a step. I want to distribute first. So let's, let's use our negative to change the limits of integration here from 0 to 1. Then I distribute my u to the 4th. I have u to the 4th plus u to the 6th du. Now I can integrate. I'm going to have 1 fifth u to the fifth plus 1 seventh u to the seventh from 0 to 1. Clearly, plugging 0 in it makes all of this go to 0. Plugging a 1 in is very easy to do mentally. I just end up with 1 fifth plus 1 seventh, which is the same thing as 12 30 fifths. That's going to be my final answer right there. Okay? Looking good, looking good. We have one more strategy to cover here, and this one is going to feel a little bit different. We're still dealing with trig functions, but this time the integrals that we're dealing with don't look like powers of sine or powers of cosine. Instead, they look like products of a sine function with a cosine function, but what's special about these is that the argument on the sine and the cosine can be different now. They don't have to be sine of x, cosine of x, or sine of x over 2, cosine of x over 2. In fact, they, they're specifically going to look like sine of mx, where m is some constant, times cosine of nx, where n is potentially some other constant than m. Okay? The way we handle these is using uh, something called a product to sum identity, which we also learn about in trigonometry. Here are the three big ones. Sine of a times cosine of b equals this. Sine of a times sine of b equals this. Cosine of a times cosine of b equals this. Okay? In fact, the reason you learn these in trigonometry is specifically to be able to do this type of integration. So let me jump into an example right away to see how we do this. And this is the last example we're going to do for this section. I want to evaluate the integral of sine of 2x times sine of 6x. This looks like this type of function, sine of a times sine of b. So I want to convert that into a different expression using this product to some identity. 
it's equal to one half times cosine of here it says a minus b. Well, in our case, a is 2x and b is 6x. So let's say 2x minus 6x. Okay, and then uh, that's just, just this first part here, minus cosine of a plus b. That's 2x plus 6x dx. Okay, I could bring the 1 half out and I can simplify things down a bit. What is 2x minus 6x? Well, that's negative 4x. But I'm going to write cosine of 4x. Where did the negative go? Shouldn't that have been a negative 4x in there? Technically, yes, but it doesn't matter because the cosine function is an even function. And so cosine of negative x or 4x or whatever it is, is the same thing as cosine of x or positive 4x or whatever. This cosine eats up that negative. Um, and then over here, I don't need to even do that because I have 2x plus 6x, which is 8x. Okay? The integration now is very straightforward because both of these can be handled uh, in a very quick way. The integral here, cosine of 4x, becomes 1 fourth sine of 4x, which would have been found using a u substitution, minus 1 eighth sine of 8x plus c. You could distribute this one half in, so I would end up with a 1 eighth and a 1 16th here. I don't really even care so much about that. I'm fine just leaving it like this because that's technically correct also. Okay, so that's it for 7.2.